In this video, we're going to be looking at proofs in the language of predicate logic. The kind of structure that proofs take uh, will represent by these sort of trees. This is an example uh, of a proof that you've already seen, where what we have is the conclusion that Sydney is east of Perth, and we've displayed in this branching tree structure the way that it depends on the premises uh, that Sydney's east of Melbourne, Melbourne's east of Adelaide, and Adelaide's east of Perth. They're combined, but we don't combine them just in a line or a sequence. Uh, the tree structure displays the order of dependence of, uh, between the premises and the conclusion. So we see that the intermediate conclusion that Melbourne is east of Perth follows, uh, we say that it follows from the two premises that are above it, that Melbourne's east of Adelaide and that Adelaide's east of Perth. And then we took that claim and combined it with this other premise that Sydney's east of Melbourne to conclude that Sydney's east of Perth. So this proof has got one conclusion. The conclusion is the statement at the end that Sydney's east of Perth. It has three assumptions or premises, uh, Sydney's east of Melbourne, Melbourne's east of Adelaide, and Adelaide's east of Perth. These are the three assumptions because we just state those. We don't, uh, we just take them for granted. We don't give any other reasons for them. And then there's this one other claim, which is not a conclusion of the whole proof and is not an assumption, but is an intermediate claim in the proof, which is a conclusion of a smaller little bit of reasoning, this little proof uh, from the assumptions two and three to that conclusion, and which then is a premise on which our ultimate conclusion rests. So it's kind of an intermediate statement in our proof. Now, a tree is going to have this sort of branching structure. This tree's got uh, a structure that I can draw like that, which has got one, two, three, four, five nodes in it that are branching like this. We'll have other trees where maybe we'll have uh, no branching at a particular point. Uh, and so, so this point here in the tree uh, has got one thing above it and one thing below it. And we might have other trees where we'll have, you know, three things combining to give us something else and so on. That's the kind of structure uh, that we'll be interested in uh, examining in proofs because it displays the dependence relation uh, between uh, claims. How, what, where's a claim being used as a reason for something and how is uh, this claim justified? The things which are not justified at all are the leaves of the tree, which we don't uh, come from anywhere else. We just assume them and we see what follows from them. Now we're going to be interested in proofs where the formulas in the proofs are formulas in the language of predicate logic. And we're going to be looking at the kinds of transitions that you can make in a proof, the kind of inference steps that you can make that depend on the logical concepts of the connectives and the quantifiers. And I've got an example proof here where, again, it's a tree. This time it's a very simple tree. Uh, it's got this sort of structure. There's two leaves of the tree. One leaf is the premise for all x, fx implies gx, all f's are g's, and one leaf is the premise fa, a is f, and the conclusion is uh, GA, or A's got property G. This is the structure of the argument that I uh, introduced this class with, you know, all football is a biped, Socrates is a footballer, so Socrates is a biped. But now we've got this sort of intermediate step here, FA implies GA, you know, if FA then GA. So that would be the claim that if Socrates is a footballer, then Socrates is a biped. Now I'll explain how this proof works, uh, looking at it step by step. So if you just focus on the first transition here, the assumption in this little step is the universal quantifier, uh, all Fs are Gs. And then the conclusion of that little step is the instance Fa implies Ga. And I've got a little tag to the right of that step saying what kind of uh, inference it was. 
and you'll see this in all of the different sorts of proofs that I write that I'll label each of the steps explaining what kind of step it is. In this case, it's the step of eliminating a universal quantifier. We've got this claim which has got a universal quantifier at the front and the rule of universal quantifier elimination allows you to take off the quantifier and replace it with an instance. Because if all Fs are Gs, then we can apply that to a particular thing, in this case A, uh, and say that if Fa, then Ga. Then uh, the next step in the proof is we make the assumption that Fa, and then we combine that with the claim that if Fa, then Ga, and eliminate the conditional now to get Ga. And this is the inference from if Fa, then Ga, Oh, and by the way, FA is true, so the conclusion is GA. So we've got that original argument that uh, we talked about, which led us from all Fs are Gs, A is an F, to A is G, and we've broken it down into two separate steps. And that's a proof, which leads us from the premise, all Fs are Gs, and the premise, FA, to the conclusion, GA. And that's a proof. I'll give you another couple of examples before then in the rest of the video listing all of the rules. Here's a more complicated proof which can show you the kinds of things uh, that we can do uh, with the rules that we'll have. Here the uh, premise in this proof is all Fs are Gs. The conclusion is uh, for all X if X is not G then it's not F. Now, there's these two other assumptions that we've made, but we've put brackets around them. And that means that by the time we've got to the end of the proof, these are no longer assumptions upon which the conclusion depends. These are assumptions which have been, been discharged. So this is a proof which leads us from the premise, all Fs are Gs, to the conclusion, all not Gs are not Fs. So if you're an F, you're a G. It follows from that that if you're not a G, you're not an F. Let's step through the proof to see how it works. It starts with uh, the first piece is exactly the same as we saw before. All Fs are Gs, so Fa implies Ga, and if we make the assumption that Fa, then we get Ga. So, so far, I haven't written these brackets around uh, the Fa yet. The Fa is an assumption that we're making for the moment. Then in the next step of the proof, we make the assumption as well that not GA. And then because we've concluded GA from the other premises, that means that the three premises, all Fs are Gs, FA and not GA together are inconsistent because the first two premises give us GA, the second premise says not GA, so we can say we've got a contradiction. This is the way you can exploit or eliminate a negation if I assume or have proved not something, and I also assume or have proved the opposite of that thing, the thing without the not, in this case it's GA and not GA, and then I can conclude that whatever I've got is inconsistent. Now, if I've got a bunch of premises which are inconsistent with each other, what I can conclude is that from any of them, I can conclude that, yeah, I can pick one of them out and say that if the others are true, this one isn't. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to pin the blame on the FA assumption and say that if all Fs are Gs and not GA, well, because FA would be inconsistent with that, I can conclude not FA. And so I introduce a negation now. This is how you prove that something is not true. You assume it, derive a contradiction, and then blame the contradiction on that assumption and say that if all the other assumptions are true, well, then this one can't be. So this is the point at which you put these uh, square brackets around the FA and we discharge the assumption. Now this conclusion, not FA, doesn't depend on the assumption FA. We've shown how it follows from all Fs are Gs and not GA. So now we put the brackets and the one around the FA, discharging that assumption to conclude not FA. And so we put this little one 
a superscript next to the uh, not I, where we've introduced the uh, negation to explain why this is this assumption here that was discharged at that point. And then uh, we can do the same sort of thing because remember, we're wanting to get to showing that if something isn't G, it isn't F. Well, we made the assumption that A wasn't G and we concluded from that that A is an F. So we're going to do the same sort of discharging thing, but now we're using it to prove an if-then statement. And so now we can conclude that since we could prove not FA from not GA together with the other stuff, we can discharge that assumption, put the square brackets around it, and now we'll put a superscript 2 there, and conclude that if not GA, then not FA. Because we've assumed all F's G's and uh, not GA to prove not FA. So if all F's of G's is true, then if not GA, then not FA. So we discharged that assumption. Uh, we made it along the way for the sake of proving this conditional. So now we've proved not GA implies not FA. And the only thing that is the assumption that is left is all F's of G's. And that's the only assumption that not GA implies not FA depends on. And so what's this A thing? Have we assumed anything about what A is? Well, we originally assumed FA and not GA, but we discharged those assumptions. Uh, so we're no longer holding on to them. We're no longer have to FA doesn't have to be true, not GA doesn't have to be true, because what we've concluded is that if A isn't G, then it is an F. But this conclusion doesn't depend on any assumptions about A. So that means it doesn't really matter what A is. A could have been absolutely anything. We've concluded something about A when we've made no assumptions uh, about what A is. Uh, we are not holding on to any of those assumptions. This applies uh, to, you know, if A is me, if A is you, if A is the sun, if A is uh, the number five. A could be absolutely anything. We assumed FA and assumed not GA for the sake of proving things, but we've discharged those assumptions that we're no longer making them. So there's there's nothing that we've uh, we've got uh, about A which tells us anything about what A is. So A could be anything we like. Uh, a is totally arbitrary. So it follows that what we've proved about A uh, works for anything. So that's how we introduce a universal quantifier. This is how we prove that uh, everything has got some property. Uh, we prove that a particular thing has got that property where we make absolutely no assumptions about what that particular thing is. Then if that proof works, it'll work for this, it'll work for that, it'll work for absolutely everything. So that's how you introduce a universal quantifier. Now I'll give you one last example uh, of a proof, this time with some existential quantifiers in it as well. And then uh, once we've done that, we'll go through uh, all of the rules so that you'll have all of the pieces to build your own proofs. This is a proof where we have made the assumption all F's of G's, uh, which we were working with uh, before. And we've made the assumption uh, something is both F and H, and the conclusion is something is both G and H. So that seems reasonable. You know, if all frogs are green and we've got a happy frog, then there's got to be a happy green thing. So let's break this proof down into parts. Uh, again, we've got the transition that we used before, all F's are G's, so FA implies GA. But now instead of assuming FA, what we do is we assume FA and HA and we conclude from that that FA. So we've got this conjunction and we eliminate the conjunction to prove a conjunct of that conjunction. And then we stick that together with the FA implies GA to get uh, GA using uh, an implication elimination. Now, why do we make the assumption that FA implies GA? Because well, what we're eventually going to assume is that something uh, is a green frog. So you can think about this as, well, if we know that something, oh, it's not a green frog, something's a happy frog, uh, there's a frog that's happy. If there is something which is an F and an H, well, we're giving such a thing a name and using that. 
to reason with. You can, you can think about uh, that and we'll explain how we can uh, discharge that assumption soon. But we've got that this thing is G, piecing together these assumptions. We'd like to use the fact that this thing is an H as well. So what we do is we, again, repeat the assumption that FA and HA and conclude HA and then uh, combine those things, introducing a conjunction to conclude GA and HA. So now we've got the assumption all Fs are Gs and using the fact that we've got this FA and HA to give us that we've got something uh, which is uh, a G and an H. And then since this object is a G and an H, we can conclude that there is something which is a G and an H, which is what we wanted to prove. But what we wanted to prove was not from the assumption that A is an F and an H, but we wanted to prove it from the assumption that something is an F and an H. But notice, now this is kind of like the universal quantifier introduction rule that I looked at in the last proof. Uh, what we've done is we've proved that there is a G and an H from the assumption that all Fs are Gs and that Fa and Ha, I just repeated that assumption twice. Now, the only thing that we've assumed about this object A is that it's an Fa and an Ha. We haven't concluded anything about the object A. We've not made any other assumptions about the object A. The only assumption that we've made about the object A is this guy, Fa and Ha. So again, the A could have been anything. So what we do is we trade that assumption in, we discharge that assumption, and we use the assumption that something is an F and an H. So we uh, write this over here as another assumption, discharge those, uh, tag it with a one so that we know, and this is how we eliminate or exploit an existentially quantified statement. Uh, if we could prove something, in this case, something's a G and an H from F A and H A, where we make no other assumptions about the object A, the conclusion here doesn't feature the object A, uh, then we could have done that. We could justify that from something is an F and an H. It doesn't need to be the object A, it could have been something else. And so we get that conclusion now from this assumption. Okay, those three examples should give you an idea of the way that we piece together the proof rules to make proofs. But now I'm going to just go through each of the rules explaining their shape and structure, and then you'll have all that you need to do to build your own rules, or your own proofs. First, uh, we'll do the rules for the connectives, then we'll do the rules for the quantifier, and we'll start with conjunction. We've already seen the rule for conjunction. If I want to prove a conjunction A and B, I prove it from both of the conjuncts. I've got to prove A and prove B. Maybe I assume them, maybe they're proved from other things, but if I've got A and I've got B, then I can write a line under it and get A and B. On the other hand, if I want to exploit or eliminate a conjunction, if I've proved A and B, then I can conclude A, or I could conclude B. They're the conjunction rules, they're really simple. Conditional rules, we've already seen. If I've uh, got a conditional A implies B, and I've got the antecedent of that conditional, I can conclude the consequent of that conditional. This is sometimes called modus ponens, uh, the rule that tells us that if A implies B and A, then I can conclude B. On the other hand, if I want to prove a conditional, the rule has got this shape, and here uh, it's a little bit more complicated because if I've got this proof here, which I'll just call pi, if I've got a proof, and the conclusion of that proof is B, and A is one of the premises in the proof, maybe it's used more than once, but if I've got a premises A, and I prove B, then I could discharge the A's, as many of them as I like, and conclude if A then B. And so I'll put a number, in this case I, uh, around the brackets, around the discharged premises, and I'll tag the rule with that I. So if I could prove B from A, that's how I can prove if A then B. And then this concluding, uh, this conclusion, if A then B, doesn't depend on the assumption A. A doesn't have to be true for if A then B to be true. The assumption has now been packed into that claim, if A then B. We trade in the conclusion B for a weaker conclusion, well, if A is, then B. But uh, 
because we've weakened the conclusion to be instead of B, just if A, then B, uh, we can pay for that by getting rid of the assumptions. And so we don't need to assume A because we've got a weaker claim. Well, if A is true, then B is true. And why is it the case that if A is true, then B is true? Because we've proved B from A. Negation rules, you've already seen some of these. If I've got not A and I've got A, then I can conclude that I'm uh, inconsistent, I've got a contradiction. On the other hand, if I've got some proof and I prove a contradiction, and A is one of the premises that I've used, then I could discharge uh, that premise, discharge that assumption, and blame it on that A to conclude not A. So I put the square brackets around, tag it with a number, in this case I, and uh, so then put the I next to the uh, label. This is how I introduce a negation. I prove a contradiction from the thing that I'm negating. If I want to show that A is not the case, I assume A and show that that's inconsistent with other facts that I that I also assume. Now, there's nothing that says that if I've proved a contradiction, I have to blame it on A. I could pick one of the other assumptions and blame it on that. And so if I've got a proof which goes from A and B and C, and I, they're all inconsistent. Well, one option would be to discharge, say, the B and say not B follows from A and C. On the other hand, I could uh, blame it on the C and say that not C follows uh, from A and B. So here we've got that if A and C is true, uh, then uh, not B is true. The symbol that I'll use for this, which I'll formally introduced at the end of the, this video is this turnstile to say I've got a proof from A and C to not B. Well that also means that I've got a proof from A and B to not C and it also means if I discharge the A that if I've got a I've got a proof from B and C to not A. And you might ask well which one is it? Is it not A? Is it not B? Is it not C? And the answer is I don't know. Uh, it depends. If A and C is true, well, it isn't B. And if A and B is true, well, then C isn't true. And if B and C is true, then A isn't true. Logic tells you the relationships between these claims. It doesn't tell us necessarily which one of them is the true one. Now, there's one other uh, rule for, actually, there's two other rules for negation. Uh, one is sort of explaining how contradictory, how bad uh, this contradiction symbol is. Uh, the, this contradiction thing is so bad that if it were true, anything would be true. Uh, we can conclude anything we like from this contradiction. And finally, uh, we need to say, uh, have this fact that if a double negation of a formula is true, we've got to be able to conclude from that that the formula is true. This is what's called double negation elimination. That doesn't follow from the other rules. Whereas the converse, which says that if A is true, then the negation of the negation of A is true, that does follow from the rules that we have like this. You know, if A and not A were both true, then that'd be inconsistent. So I can blame this on not A and say, okay, well, it's not not A. And that's a proof which leads from A to not not A. Uh, but there's no proof just using these three rules, which leads us from not not A to A. And in two value truth tables, that's going to be a valid argument. So if we want the proofs to agree with the truth tables, we've got to add that as an extra rule. So we do. Now, uh, disjunction. I haven't given you any examples about disjunction. Uh, that's because the disjunction rule is a bit of a complex one. Well, the introduction rules aren't. Uh, from A, I can conclude A or B, and from B, I can conclude A or B. Both of those are fine. The question is, what can I prove from A or B? Well, what I would love to do is to say that, well, if A or B is true, then either A is true or B is true. But proof trees don't have this downward branching structure, so I can't do that. But I'm going to do basically a similar sort of thing, because uh, if A or B is true, and if I could prove something from A, and I could prove something from B, then I could prove it from A or B, regardless. Because if A is true, then 
then this conclusion C is true because I can prove it from A. And if B is true, then this conclusion is true because I can prove it from B. So that's, that's the structure of the disjunction rule. It looks like this. If I can prove this conclusion from A using one proof, and I can prove the conclusion from B using another proof, then I can discharge the assumptions A in the first part, first proof, and discharge the assumptions B in the second part, using two different tags for them, I and J. And then I'll use my A or B as a different assumption to justify the conclusion that C. Because if A is true, then this part of the proof will work. And if B is true, then this part of the proof will work. Uh, in either case, we've got C. So that's the disjunction rule. Now, the last rules are the quantifier rules. And I've already explained them, uh, but now I'll show you how they work in general. To eliminate a universal quantifier, if I've got a universally quantified formula, I can conclude any instance, put any term I like, name or variable, in the conclusion. If everything's got property A, then the object T has got property A. On the other hand, if I can prove that the object little a has got property A, and the object A that I'm talking about is arbitrary, if I've made no assumptions about what A is, so in particular, in this proof, which is why I'm talking about the premises X of that proof here, if those premises X don't say anything about A, then this proof proving that this object has got property A is totally general. And so we've proved that everything has got that property. So in that rule, we need this condition to be satisfied. In any universal quantifier introduction, the term A, which I am generalizing to the say that everything has got that property, cannot occur either elsewhere in this conclusion. So we replaced all of the A's by this variable X, or in any assumption that's here. And if that's the case, then A is totally arbitrary. And so we can conclude from that uh, the object A has got property big A, then everything's got that property. That's the universal quantifier introduction. And now uh, existential quantifier, exactly the same shape, except in reverse. From an existentially quantified formula, I'm oh, sorry, I can prove an existentially quantified formula from an instance. If T has got property A, then something's got property A, namely T, the obvious. And then if I could prove some conclusion B from the assumption that the object B has got property A, then I could also prove that conclusion B from the assumption that something's got that property, provided that the uh, name B that I'm using here does not occur in the conclusion, capital B, and doesn't occur in any of the other assumptions. So this is, again, we need B to be arbitrary. So that might be a lot of rules. That is definitely a lot of rules. And if you haven't seen them before, that'll be quite, uh, quite a lot to, to uh, absorb. But what we're going to be doing now is doing lots of practice. You can now practice. You've got everything that you need to start making proofs, to start reading proofs, to start checking proofs. And that's what we're going to be doing now. So, uh, But first, a little bit of notation. If I've got a proof from the premises X to the conclusion A, then we say that the argument from X to A and the symbols that we'll use for arguments uh, is this little Y on its side, uh, this little uh, turnstile from X to A. The argument from X to A will say that has a proof or is provable. That's what it is if I can get a proof from the premises X to the conclusion A. And if I can get a proof from X to A, we'll write this flat turnstile, uh, X turnstile A, to say that A can be proved from X. So the proof tells us how we can get from X to A. And what we're going to do is we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in the beginning of the class just dealing with proofs in predicate logic, and then we're going to relate proofs to models in predicate logic so that we can then get a sense of the power and limits of predicate logic. So now 
you can go and make some of your own proofs. So I'll leave that to you.